This essay sucks. I've just passed a criticism on someone else's work. I've provided no explanation as to why I think it sucks and I've made no attempt to suggest improvements. So have I really provided any value here or have I just been a bit of a poo? Yep, I'm being a five star turd. And this is precisely the problem that plagues many of the essays we write, especially when we're under pressure. At the end of this video, you'll go from making vague comments like, this is weak evidence, to intelligent comments like this. This uncontrolled non-randomized study provides weak evidence due to several confounding factors and biases. Further controlled and longitudinal studies are required to investigate this further. Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. My name's Shane. I'm a recently qualified doctor and neuroscience supervisor at Oxford University. And today we're going to learn how to critically analyze evidence like a pro and impress your professors. But before we begin, let's see why it's important to analyze evidence in the first place. Here's one of the criteria an essay needs to meet in order to be awarded a first class at Cambridge University. Work which is excellent both in the range and command of the material covered and in the argument and analysis. Work that has shown some originality and treated the evidence critically. So to get any hope of seeing a first class mark, you have to critically analyze the evidence you use to back up your points. But as we've seen, critical analysis isn't just about making a mean comment and moving on. Instead, it involves constructively commenting on the level of evidence, study design, confounding factors, and biases involved. So let's get into it and learn about some important principles and stock phrases that will get the examiners excited. The first and easiest thing to comment on when you're analysing any evidence is to comment on where it falls within the hierarchy of evidence. This is the hierarchy and it looks like a pyramid. Well, strictly a triangle but it's often known as a pyramid of evidence. You get what I mean. So the very top with the most clout and legitness is the meta-analysis or systematic review. These type of studies are essentially boss studies that pull together data from loads of different primary studies, which makes them very powerful and very legit, provided they've been done well, of course. Then you have the RCTs or randomized control trials. These are studies that usually compare an intervention or therapy to a control, and they randomly allocate participants to each arm. It's kind of a gold standard of primary research. Then going further down, you have prospective studies like the cohort study, which essentially follows a group of people, also known as a cohort, into the future. And they measure different variables. It can be really good to proving causality. Then going further down, you have the retrospective version of the cohort study, which is known as the case control study. These studies look back on data on those who have a disease, often known as cases, and compare them to data from matched controls. These studies often investigate risk factors associated with a particular disease. Then you have all the other levels of evidence with lower clout and lower legitness. Stating the level of evidence is a pretty reasonable way to justify why you think evidence is weak or strong. And therefore, it's a pretty easy mark to pick up right away. But beware, not every research question can be answered by every study design. It may be that the research question isn't appropriate for a randomized control trial, but a cross-sectional study Study is most appropriate. So bear that in mind when you're passing your comments. Let's now move on and look more specifically at study design. The next important thing that you can comment on when you're critically analysing evidence is the study design. Here are some questions to ask. What population was the study conducted on? What was the intervention? Was it compared to anything like a control? Was this control a placebo, aka a dummy? Or was it the current best therapy? How did they measure the outcomes? Starting off with, what was the population the study was conducted on? Say for example, if the population used were mice, it would be a pretty long shot to generalize the findings from mice all the way to humans. So in your essay, you might say something like, although the evidence from this study was promising, it has limited generalizability to humans, as the population studied were mice in an artificial environment. Or maybe the study was looking at heart failure, but they only used people with severe forms of heart failure. Although the evidence from this study is promising, it has limited generalizability generalizability to those with mild forms of heart failure and further studies are needed which include a broader spectrum of disease from mild to severe. So when commenting on study design, comment on the population and the generalizability of the findings. The next questions to answer about the study design are what was the intervention, 
and was it compared to a control? Now, arguably, this is one of the most important parts of any study that's proposing that a new treatment is better than the old. So whenever you're quoting evidence for this, comment on if the researchers actually compared the new therapy to the old one. And sometimes researchers are a bit cheeky and they compare a new therapy to a dummy or a placebo rather than comparing it to the current best therapy. Say the researchers have developed a new treatment for heart failure. If they don't compare it to the current therapy, we don't really know if it's better. So really, it's not just enough comparing it to a placebo, they also have to compare it to the current best therapy. Now, of course, lots of study designs don't actually compare one thing to another because they're not actually trying to prove something is better, maybe they're trying to prove a mechanism of action. Like for example, an increased activity in the insula of the brain causes a feeling of craving. In which case, it becomes quite important to comment on outcome measures, which is the last thing to talk about in a study design. In a lot of studies, the actual outcome that we're all interested in is quite difficult to measure. So the researchers end up measuring what's known as a surrogate endpoint. These surrogate endpoints tend to be easier to measure and assume to be related to the outcome that we're actually interested in. Let's say a drug therapy is claiming to make you live longer if you've got lung cancer. But instead of measuring survival rates, which could take several years, they measure the level of a particular molecule that's associated with the severity of disease. So the researcher says, look, this drug therapy causes the level of this molecule to go down. And because the level of the molecule is associated with the severity of disease, this therapy allows you to live longer. I hope you can see how this is a bit problematic. All they've done is measure a surrogate endpoint, a molecule level, rather than actually measuring survival rates, which like I said, could take several years to collect data on. So in your essay, you could say something like, whilst the evidence shows a decrease in X molecule, we cannot use this surrogate endpoint to make conclusions about survival. Further longitudinal studies measuring survival rates are required to investigate this. Another thing to comment on when you're talking about outcomes is the tools they use to measure it. Has the outcome measure been objectively validated? Or in other words, does it actually measure the thing it claims to measure? For example, let's go back to the study that tried to figure out if the insula was associated with a feeling of craving. If they use brain imaging to measure insula activity, we can comment on if imaging actually measures activity. How can we be sure that just because the area of the brain lights up on imaging, that it actually means greater activity? Similarly, how are they measuring the feelings of craving? Do they use a questionnaire or a behavioral observation like how many pieces of cake they eat? And in each case, have these measures been independently and objectively validated to actually measure craving. These are just some ideas of things you can comment on when you're talking about study design. Now let's move on to confounding. Confounding happens when the independent variable and the dependent variable is associated with a third variable. Let's say we carry out a study looking at the level of exercise and diabetes. And we find that as the level of activity increases, the risk of developing diabetes goes down. So at first glance, it might seem that exercise reduces the risk of diabetes. However, it might be that those who perform more exercise also tend to be younger. So in fact, this apparent association between level of activity and diabetes could actually just be driven by age. In this case, age is a confounding factor. Confounding tends to occur most in non-randomized trials, where the group receiving the intervention and the control are very different by several means. The best way to get around this problem is randomization. So you get a bunch of people and randomly allocate them to either the control group or the intervention group, in this case, exercise. This means that confounding factors like BMI, age, and ethnicity is split up equally between the two groups. And any difference in the risk of diabetes that we see is actually being driven by the level of exercise rather than any of these confounding factors. So in your essays, whenever you see a non-randomized trial, you could say something like, the lack of randomization introduces several confounding factors, such as age, BMI and ethnicity, which limits the conclusions we can draw from this study. To overcome this, we need randomized trials that go on to utilize intention to treat analysis. Now I know what you're thinking. What on earth is intention to treat analysis? Don't worry, it sounds more complex than it really is. Essentially, it's a way of analyzing the data that helps to maintain the randomization. Inevitably, people who've been assigned to the exercise group are gonna drop out from that group, meaning they lose interest and they stop exercising. And equally, those in the control group or the no exercise group might actually decide, you know what, I fancy doing some exercise. 
and they start doing so. Now, you might be thinking, whoa, 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 you're not allowed to do that because that messes up the whole randomization. But actually, it's fine if we carry out an intention to treat analysis. And if we do that, this actually represents what happens in the real world. Think about it. People don't always stick to what they're meant to be doing. So when you carry out an ITC or intention to treat analysis, all you do is maintain the randomization. And even though people have dropped out of their original group and into the other group, you actually just treat them as if they were in their original assigned group. This is a great way to maintain the randomization that you achieved at the initial stage and minimize confounding. Now let's talk about biases. Let's say you're running a study to compare the effect of a new treatment for balding versus the current therapy, and you're measuring hair growth in a month as the outcome. To do this, you might run a study where you get a bunch of bald people and split them into two groups. One group gets the new therapy, and the other group gets the old one. Now, the only difference between the two groups should be the treatment they receive, because of the clever randomization we've done. However, Pesky biases can creep in and mess up this study. A bias is something other than the treatment that causes the two groups to be systematically different. And as a result, it distorts the conclusion we can draw. There are many types of biases. Let's meet some of them. This fellow is selection bias. He happens when the researchers pick a bunch of people that aren't representative of the target population. It's like trying to make claims about bald people when you've only used people in the study who've got a full head of hair. So any conclusions you draw from the study won't actually apply to those who are bald. So the best way to minimize this fellow is to have a representative population of the target population that you actually want to apply the results on. And once you've recruited participants into the study, you should randomly allocate them to each arm. This lady is performance bias. She happens when the researchers treat the two groups differently other than the therapy they receive. Let's say the researchers meet the bald people receiving the new therapy at least three times a week to answer any of their questions, but they don't meet those who are receiving the old therapy at all. This causes a difference in the way in which each of these groups was treated. So at the end of the study, when you measure the level of hair growth after a month, we can't be sure if this was due to the therapy they received or is it driven by the attention and therefore stress relief that one group got more of. So the best way to minimize performance bias is to treat everyone equally. And the best way to make sure that happens is to blind everyone. That might seem a bit extreme, but let me explain what that means. Double blinding is when neither the participant or the researcher knows what therapy each of them are receiving. That way, both groups will be treated equally and there will be no preferential treatment. This fella is attrition bias. He happens when people drop out of the study unequally. Let's say half of the people receiving the new therapy just decide, you know what, I don't want this anymore and decide not to turn up. There may be a systematic difference between those who left and those who remained. And as a result, it might distort any conclusion that you could draw. The best way to minimize attrition bias is to have excellent follow-up and make sure there are some incentives and stuff put in place so that people actually turn up. And of course, you should run an intention to treat analysis. And finally, this lady is detection bias. She happens when researchers measure the outcomes differently for each group. Let's say the researchers measure hair growth using a sophisticated laser as well as a visual analysis on the treatment group receiving the new therapy, but they only use visual analysis in those receiving the old therapy. This results in a systematic difference between how outcome measures was measured between different groups. And especially with subjective measures like visual analysis, the researchers might expect hair growth to be greater in the new therapy, so they're more likely to judge it favorably. So the best way to minimize detection bias is to make sure everyone gets the same outcome measures. And of course, double blind everyone so no one knows who's getting what. Now that you've learned about critical analysis, try putting it all together. And you might like to check out this video to help you with that. Anyway, that's it from me for now. Thanks for watching. And I'll see you guys next time.